Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this conference on archives of print culture in Southern Africa. Uh, my name is Beth LaRue. I'm in the Department of Information Science at the University of Pretoria. And this is our eighth um, seminar or conference on book history in Southern Africa that we've held. It would have been the 10th. This is year 10 since we started. But of course, COVID had other plans, so we missed two in between. But we're very happy to be back again and be active and generating this network. Um, I think I want to start up front by acknowledging our co-hosts. This was this is a collaborative venture very much. So it's a collaboration between the University of Pretoria, Wits University and University College London. It grows out of a long standing collaboration between myself and Caroline Davis, who is at University College London now. And unfortunately, she can't be with us and she had to step out of organizing, but she's with us in spirit at least. And we hope very much that we do her justice with our discussions and our presentations and our engagement over the next two days. Um, archives of print. So what we wanted to discuss here, what we really were thinking about was what are the records that we access and that we are able to access on different aspects of print, authorship and publishing and readership as well. We're particularly interested in issues of access, of inclusion and exclusion. These are issues that Caroline, Caroline and I have been dealing with for some time and other historians of the region, of course, have also been dealing with. So issues like whose histories have been recorded and whose have been erased, where can we access these? What are the power dynamics underlying the preservation of various kinds of materials in the archives. Just one of those examples is the need to go and access different kinds of records in other countries that may have belonged originally to a Southern African country, but have now been bought in by a country, perhaps in North America or Europe. And of course, there's problems of access as well. Digitization can be a, an assistance with that. It can facilitate ways of engaging with the historical records, but it can also introduce new problems of copyright and access as well. So what we really want to talk about over these next two days are some case studies of different kinds of records and archives that people have been able to access. We're very interested in hearing about what kinds of material can be found in the archives as opposed, for instance, to um, oral histories and to popular understandings of various histories. I'm very interested in the distinctions between evidence-based histories and other kinds of history and those based on memory, for example, and how they intersect and how we can bring these different kinds of records together for our future studies. Um, I don't think I'm going to say a great deal Further than that, really, I, I know that we usually leave thanks for the, the very end, but I want to also start up front by thanking my organizing team who's worked so hard to get this up and running and to make sure that this hybrid format that we're working with is successful and we hope it's successful. Bear with us if we have any teething problems, please. First of all, I need to thank my colleague Letitia Castles, who worked with me at the University of Pretoria for many years and is now at Wits University. She has done amazing work in setting this up and at the same time is trying to finish off her PhD. So much strength to you, Letitia, and very many thanks for your assistance. And I also want to thank the team at the University of Pretoria and specifically my colleague, Anna Canell, who's really taken over the management of, we've got students who are involved here, some of our JCP students who are um, students who are working in community projects, for example. <clears throat> and we're very happy to have them involved in the organization and marketing of this conference as well. They're responsible for some of the designs that you've seen on the program, for example, and on some of the slides that you'll see as we continue. So I hope that we have a very productive two days. I, I think it's going to be very interesting. We've got a really nice range of different kinds of papers and different presenters. And please feel free to participate and ask questions and get involved. We'll try to do as much networking as we can 
given the constraints of an online and hybrid conference as well. So um, I think that's all I want to start with for my welcome. From there, I think we can move over to the first session. Thank you. Thanks so much, Beth. Um, I think the JCP team is now sharing a slide for our poll that we're having. We organized a tour of the underground booksellers in Joburg City for Saturday. So we are running an online poll and you are welcome to indicate if you are willing or able to join us for that tour Saturday morning at 10 a.m. starting at the Rand Club in Joburg and Commissioner Street. Um, Annika, can I just get an indication if our pan panelists are ready as our first panel? We're just getting things organized. We'll be with you in just a moment. I think I was probably supposed to speak for longer, so sorry about that. I prefer to hear what everybody else has to say. Okay, great. Apparently our poll is having a little bit of issues, so please um, bear with us. And Janet is busy setting out her, uh, sorting out her settings so she can present. Thank you. Yes, I can tell you more about the underground tour. Uh, the Wits University Publishing Department has a fantastic community partner this year, Bridge Books, and we're working with them to get our students more involved in the local literary district, which they are developing. The underground booksellers tour is developed by Griffin Shea at Bridge Books, and he'll be taking us on Saturday. And it's a walking tour of about two and a half to three hours, exploring the gray market and the informal book market in Joburg City. We'll be walking around historical sites and showing you the not bookshop market for books that is available in South Africa. Um, hello, everyone. Can you hear? Yes. Can yes. You? Unfortunately, I can't seem to get the video to show up. I think there's some setting. Um, it looks like it's on on my side, but it's not showing up. Is there a host setting? And also Charles and Corsi are here as fellow palinists. And so it'd be great if they could be on screen as well. Ah, there's Corsi. Great. Oh, there we go. Great, we're with you. And Charles, are you there in the background? I seem to have disappeared again. Sorry, everyone, we're just uh, sorting out a few technicalities. Charles, would it be great if you wouldn't mind coming on screen as well, um, if that's okay. I can see myself, but uh, can you? Yeah. Oh, there you are. So I think it only maybe comes on when someone's speaking. Okay. Are you I able to see me or not? I do see you. Yes. Oh, yeah. fine. Okay. I'm a bit confused at what I can see and you can all see. Okay. Okay. We can see one of you at a time when you speak, and we can okay. see. Okay, that's why I'm a bit confused. Okay, we're with you. Thanks, everyone. Um, well, really good to to gather here today, and thank you to to Beth and to Caroline and to to all of the um, participants and, and partners in this, in this undertaking. So we've got a, a panel session today with the three of us, Makosa Zana Klaba, otherwise known to many of you as, as Corsi, and uh, Charles Fonge. I think Corsi is a 
Associate Professor of Practice at the University of Johannesburg, poet, activist, national treasure, and much, much, much besides. Uh, Charles is university archivist at the University of York, working in the Borthwick Institute for Archives. And I am Janet Remington. I am an, a research associate at the University of York and also at WITS in the African Literature Department. And I also work during daylight hours as a publisher, an academic publisher for Routledge, Taylor and Francis. So today, in this combined session on Noni Jabavu's life and archival afterlives, we'll be reflecting on some, on some of our experiences and efforts to uncover further records and traces of Noni Jabavu, who, as we know, lived a very full and extraordinarily mobile life across different, uh, different countries, uh, different continents, um, and of course he will, in, in the next part of our panel, will be elaborating on this incredible arc of her life across uh, so many different settings and, and contexts. And of course he will also share some insights from this quest to follow archival tracks of all kinds across the world in seeking to better understand the texture of her life and literature. And then Charles and I will turn to focus on the UK-based archival material related to Jabavu, specifically that which is up north um, in, in the Borthwick Institute um, at the University of York. And I'll focus on the period of, of Noni Jabavu's life um, when she was a, a teenager, a, a schoolgirl in York. And Charles will pay some attention to the materials that she herself deposited in the archives at York in the 1970s. Um, there is, of course, so much that we can't cover about Jabavu's archives given their sprawling and still emerging nature. And this is the, one of the points we'd like to discuss collectively here today, while also sharing a few findings about, um, about our journeys so far. Given Jabavu's highly peripatetic and changeable life, as, as Corsi will go on to, to discuss, as well as the broader socio-political and historical context, we're very much thinking about the extent to which archival records and traces are scattered and submerged, and in some cases, severed or sunk. We think too of questions of self-archiving self and styling, as was the case to some extent for Jabavu, and also of questions of archival imprints, afterlives, silences and memorialization. So at this point, I'll hand over to Kosi, who will give us a biographical overview and some discussion of her, her, of her archival travels. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Janet, for that intro. I've never been called a national treasure. <laughs> that was funny. And thank you for inviting me to share on Noni Chababu. I'm very excited that Michael Tattlestead is part of this conversation because this project started when I was doing my first year in Masters in Creative Writing at Wits University. So towards the end of the first semester, Michael brought in somebody to talk to us as students about biographical work. And the assignment that we got at the end of that was to write, I think it was 3000 words, a day in the life of. And I chose to write about the day in the life of Noni Chabavu. And I chose the day of her return, which was the 5th of May, her return to South Africa, which was the 5th of May, 2002, because I just thought I would find materials easily and it would be fun to write about that. 
However, I ended up finding very little material. In 2002, there was virtually nothing on Noni. There was only information on her father, DDT Jabavu, and some information on her grandfather, John Tengu Jabavu. So I ended up writing an essay that had a lot of questions rather than answers because I started being very curious about this, that, and that aspect of her life. And that's when the idea of this biography project was birthed. So it's been a very long journey, but I think in terms of um, participating here, I kept looking at the title and thinking, archives in Southern Africa archives in Southern Africa. So I've been navigating archives on a Southern African person who lived in some countries in Southern Africa, but the archive has been everywhere. So that's what I'm gonna be sharing. Uh, could I have the next slide, Charles? Thanks. So Noni was born uh, in 1919 on the 20th of August, named, given the names Helen Nontando Chababu in Alice. 1919 is three years into the formation of what we now call Fort Hare University. So she left in 1933 to go and do her, finish her high school education at York. So what I've done in the slide is to just show what she calls the peripatetic print of her life, the, the, the range of where she's been. So in the UK, for instance, Oxford, Birmingham, Buckingham Palace in London. In South Africa, yes, she was born in Alice and her parents moved to a farm in Middle Drift. But when she returned to South Africa, she spent a little bit of time at Rhodes University, some time in Cape Town and uh, in Johannesburg. She lived in Uganda, Kenya, in Zimbabwe. In Uganda, she was there with her husband, Michael Cadbury Crossfield and the daughter Tembi. And in Kenya, she was there in the 60s. And in Zimbabwe, that was the last country she was living in before returning to South Africa. She also spent some time in Jamaica in the 60s, in the early 60s. And she traveled a lot to the Caribbean countries. I haven't listed all of them here because it's been hard to find material that is related and specific to the country. At some point, she was also traveling and doing some journalistic writing, which is how she went to France, Switzerland, Italy. I remember reading somewhere that she had been writing from Mexico. So she did a bit of time in Latin America as well, similarly with Northern America. So she died on the 18th of June, at the Lynette Elliott Frail Care Center in East London, which is the home she moved into when she returned to South Africa. So that's just a brief overview of what I've been able to put together about her life. The next slide, please, Charles. So we know her as a writer because I came across her as a writer because I found the book drawn in color at a secondhand bookstore. I remember when I found that book, I thought, oh, it was published in 1960 and it's been out of print and I've never heard of her. This was before I started the, 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 the creative writing course. And I was just so fascinated by the fact that she wrote this memoir that was published in 1960. So the navigation of the archives led me to the following. From 1942 to 1963, she worked at the BBC radio. She was a freelance broadcaster. She would do some sessions over the years. Uh, she's done a whole range of um, radio programs. But the one that she was doing in 1942 was of great interest to me because it was on music. So she would interview uh, women who were singers, musicians, and mostly jazz. Some of them were based in the UK and others were based in uh, the Caribbean. And then in time, she would do different kinds of programs. In 1961 to 1962, she was appointed as the editor of the New Strand magazine. 
a magazine that had closed down very early on and it was um, re, what's the word, remodeling itself. So part of that was about finding an editor. And this is 1961, the book had just come out and it had done very, very well. Um, I have a record of it having been reprinted five times in, in 1960, but there could, be, there could have been more reprints. I haven't found them yet. So she gets appointed as the editor of the New Strand magazine, and there is a lot of conversation about what it means to have somebody who was not born in the UK, somebody who's a woman, somebody who's Black, become an editor of this magazine. And then in 1962, her first memoir was translated into Italian, which I thought was very interesting, but I still don't have the connections on, I haven't even been able to lay my hands on the copy. I don't know who translated it. I don't understand what the trajectory was because her movements were fascinating in, and, and she made connections in interesting ways all over the world. 1963, the second memoir, which is a sequel to the first one, comes out again from John Murray, but both books were then taken on by, um, uh, I remember the name of the publisher in the, U in, in the US. So 1977, she's in South Africa doing research towards uh, her father's biography and she's invited to write it, a weekly column that was called Noni on Wednesdays. And then in 1982, the Orca People was published by Raven Press, which meant that this was the first time that any of her memoirs were published in South Africa. But even that one is also out of print. 1980 to 87, she wrote on and off for the Herald newspaper in Harare. And I have subsequently found copies of that. So I wanted to focus here on what can be accessed uh, that she wrote uh, for people who are interested in her, her writings. So on this last slide, I am sharing a, what's the word I want to use? Okay, selected examples, as I said, uh, of where I have found materials that are helping me to reconstruct her biography. The very first place was the National English Literature Museum, NELM, as they were called then. And now they are Amazu Museum of Literature. They're based in Makanda. And they were these letters that she had written while she was living in Zimbabwe to a friend who then decided that she'll just deposit them somewhere. So what was very useful about those letters is that I began to understand her life in a way that suggested for me how I could plan my research trajectory. So this is 2005 when I find these letters. And I think till this day, some of the archives I'm accessing is because of the little bits of information that are found in these letters, because she was just sharing with a friend and not necessarily um, trying to construct her life for her. But the friend would ask questions and then she would respond. And then that would lead me to, oh, okay, so you went to this country as well. So those letters were a treasure. Uh, from the Johannesburg Public Library, I found the archives of the Daily Dispatch. And that's where I found her columns, the Noni on Wednesday columns. Recently, I found a, the Olive Schreiner letters. I was doing something else. I wasn't even doing a Jababu <laughs> research. But what fascinated me about being in that online um, archive is that there's information on her grandfather, Tengu Jababu, and information on Margaret Clark. Now, Margaret Clark 
was a great friend to Ian Smuts, and Ian Smuts was a great friend to Didi Tijababu, known as father. And she became the foster parent, foster mother, when Noni left for York. And Margaret was married to, um, I love how I always forget his name, but he, he was married to, uh, it will come back to me. So she would move between Oxford, they lived in Oxford. She would move between Oxford and York. And that was a home while she was in high school. And then the Jagger Library at the University of Cape Town, I found letters between Jan Smuts and Margaret Clark. And this was towards the end of 2019, which means it was before the Jagger Library went on fire, which means I'm very anxious about whether these, this correspondence is still there. But what was interesting about this communication is that because of the connections I've just mentioned, Margaret would talk about Noni and say, oh, Noni, this and this and this, high school, this and this and this. It was just a lovely kind of um, engagement from the Margaret Clark perspective talking about the, um, her foster daughter, so to speak. So, the Cory Library at, at, at Rhodes University has papers of Alexandra Kerr. Now, Alexandra Kerr, Alexander Kerr taught at Forte University in, in 1916 when it opened, and he was teaching with DDT Jabavu. Interestingly, the Cory Library does not have any of DDT Jabavu's papers. And when I was there long ago, nobody could explain to me why that is. But I did end up finding some papers at the University of South Africa, which is a distant learning university in this country. And it seemed to me that those papers were only gathered after he had died. And I say this because what is most visible in those papers is the public, I will call it the public engagement with her death, be it accepts in newspapers, be it cards that were sent to the family, that kind of stuff. But that was very interesting. And then there was a photograph that I think Charles will share of Noni while she was at York. And I just thought, wow, this is interesting. So it was clear that somebody had taken the initiative and wanted to put something together because they were not donated by DDT himself. And then the John Murray archives, of course, this is her publisher. I was able to go there and read the correspondence that Noni had with her editor while she was working on both books, which was absolutely fascinating uh, because as a writer myself, I engage a lot with publishers, and with, with editors, and it's always a very interesting journey. So the John Murray archives have kept all that correspondence. But what was also interesting for me is how that correspondence is not only about the editing process, but also about the politics of the time. Okay, so the British Library, has the BBC archives. And I spoke about earlier, I spoke about the radio programs that she did. So I was able to get the transcripts of all the programs that she, she did. And they also had the New Strand magazine. And that's how I was able to get uh, all her editorials while she was at the New Strand. And then in London, I was also able to visit the library of the Society of Friends, Quakers in, Brit in Britain, and Michael Cadbury Crossfield deposited a biography of his life there. So I managed to get that copy. St. John's College Library, Oxford has the online papers of Robert Graves. 
Now, Robert Graves for Noni was the mentor. That's how she wrote about him. She would say, I was with Robert and we talked about this and this and this and this and this and this, and we discussed this and this and this, particularly the time when she was at the New Strand magazine. They had a lot of communication, but Noni was also friends with Robert Graves' wife at the time, Beryl, and their communication continued post Robert Graves' death. So it's a very, uh, what's the word? It's a very detailed sort of archive. It's categorized in very particular ways. You can go in, look for these letters and those letters. I haven't been able to finish my navigation of this archive, but it's a very interesting for me trajectory because of the relationship that Noni had with Roberts, because not only was she uh, communicating about the strand, Robert would invite Noni to Maloka, where he had a, a writing place, to, so to say. And they would be there writing together. I, I get a sense that most of, not most, that some of the writing of her second memoir happened when they were together in Maloka. But also in the letters, the communication between Noni and Beryl is very interesting. And then lastly, I thought I'd share the fact that um, they are the Margaret Clark and Gillet, Margaret Clark Gillet papers in the trust. Uh, yeah, I think that's where I'll end. There's quite a lot. But the point I, I wanted to make um, when I chose these archives is the point about what it means to try and put a biography together, putting together a biography of somebody who never really settled anywhere, which is why I have that first slide to show her movements and the fact that even she calls herself somebody who has a peripatetic print. So it's been fascinating to do this navigation and some of the archives that I've been to We'll just offer one sentence and I'm able to then connect certain things and certain details about her biography. It's been very challenging. It's been a lot of fun and it continues. I think I'll end there. Thanks so much, Corsi. There's so much to, uh, to, uh, to explore in what you've shared and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and points for discussion at the end. Um, so I'm going to turn now to the, the UK, specifically the York archives. Um, thanks, Charles. So as has been mentioned, uh, the Borthwick intersects with her life in two different ways. First in the early period of the 1930s, and then later on in the 1970s when she is an adult. So I'm going to in the next slide, I'll just give a bit of an explanation about how I came to this project. So a couple of years ago, I applied for a grant from the Humanities Research Center at the University of York uh, to do a public engagement and partnership project. Um, so I had explored some aspects of Noni Jabavu's life and work um, as part of my doctoral research one of many, many figures, black South African figures in my study on black travel and the politics of mobility. But I, I'd been conscious that I was in York at the time and there was this York connection with Noni that I'd not had a chance to explore, but it was kind of you know on my doorstep. So it seemed like it was be good to, to really optimize that opportunity. So, um, yes, I, I managed to get this grant and its focus was on raising public awareness and also on partnering with non-academic, um, uh, um, well, you had to, you, you, yeah, going beyond the academy, so to, to have some, some civic contribution. So, um, so what, so 
I obviously one has to start in the archives and um, there were some challenges here with COVID, of course. So the, the archives were closed for about a year. Um, and there were some challenges also in reaching out to the, the alma mater of, of Jabavu, the Mount School. Um, in the end, everything came together quite well. And I think once they realized um, what an interesting figure uh, Noni Jabavu was, and I think you know, they were also dealing with a lot of different issues at the time of, of COVID, but we all uh, came together. And one of the, the outputs in 2021 was to deliver this um, seminar or, or um, public talk actually as part of the York Festival of Ideas. And um, so I'll move on now to, oh, maybe just one last thing to say, as I was really conscious that, I think we we're all, all conscious that, um, that not enough, there, there isn't enough awareness of, of, of Noni Jabavu in the uh, public consciousness. And certainly I think less so in the UK than in South Africa, you know, as a result of the work that Corsi and Atambile and other, other scholars um, have undertaken over the past several years. The, and also, uh, yeah, as there's been more general recuperation of, of black lives and archives, there has been more, more awareness of, of Noni in South Africa, but very much less so in the UK. So part of the exercise was to try and bring bring her to, to the public attention. So now uh, turning, turning to the archives, um, actually just one last thing here is, I was very fortunate with the timing in getting access to the archives because I know when, when Corsi had tried at an earlier point um, uh, prior to 2008, um, it wasn't possible to get access to the archives because at that point, uh, Noni, Noni was still alive and there were various restrictions and sensitivities around school records, um, more, more generally around, around school records for anyone um, trying to access. So um, in the event of her passing, there, uh, there were some... Um, yeah, I had the opportunity to, to, to look into it further. So, um, yes, yeah, so now just to, to give you a bit of context about the school, it's a private Quakers girls school established in York in the 18th century. Uh, it, it attempted to give a broad education and encourage creative and sporting interests. And it placed an emphasis on giving its privileged students a wider worldview and exposing exposing these students to to different social and cultural contexts. The Mount School archives comprise a wide range of materials, both of an official and a more personal nature. So I searched through school registers, reports, records, correspondence, photographs, financial accounts. And, and all sorts of um, other miscellaneous items, and also through items produced or donated by the girls themselves, such as magazines, diaries, photos, and letters. So here we can see some photos of the school's centenary party in 1931, three years before Nani arrived. And in the next slide, we'll have some images of school life as were produced in the 1930s. And, um, and coming up, uh, I think is, is the, the, one of the complete highlights of, of doing, of doing this, this, this research was coming across this class photo of, of Noni in 1936, in the year that she was leaving the school in, in her year of matriculation. So she was around 16 at the time. And here is a close up of that, of that class photograph and superimposed alongside 
is a picture of Arthur uh, Arthur Gillett or or, or Gillet, Gillet, um, who was her foster father in the UK, based in Oxford, married to Margaret Clark, as as uh, Noni mentioned earlier, and uh, Arthur. Gillett was a prominent Quaker on the board of Barclays Bank, the nephew of Joseph Roundtree and a trustee of the Roundtree Charitable Trust in York. The Gillets secured the bursaries to cover Nonnie's tuition fees and to support her studies at the Mount. And their daughter, Helen, was also a fellow pupil with, with Nonnie. School records show that Nonnie shared a dorm with Helen Gillett, and that there were also, there were Crossfield girls at the Mount at the same time that she was there. The networks forged at the school had an effect on shaping many aspects of her life. Um, and, uh, you know, for example, a decade and a half later, in 1951, she would go on to marry Michael Cadbury Crossfield as, as uh, as Noni mentioned, and uh, the Cadburys and the Crossfields, very prominent uh, Quaker families. Noni was at the Mount School from 1934 to 1936, and the archive tracks her time there. And it, shed light, it sheds light, for example, on her parents' ambition for her to become a doctor, and it provides early evidence also of her literary talents. And it also possibly holds her earliest published works. The records show that she studied maths, English, history, biology, and French. And she was, and also um, at, at this early stage, it was very clear that she was a gifted musician and she learned both the violin and piano. And she really excelled in music. And as we know later, went on to study at the London's, at London um, Royal Academy of Music. So now coming um, on to a focus on her writing in this last section of, of my part of the presentation, she showed a strong aptitude for English language and literature. She became actively involved in the school's literary society and contributed three pieces over the years to the Literary Society's magazine called The White Cow. Um, and I think we'll move on to look in a bit more detail. So her third contribution is, I think her most interesting and personal. Um, it most closely resonates with her later work and style. Um, this excerpt is from her, her story, her, um, account called The Return, and it was submitted to the magazine in 1937, about a year after she had left the Mount School. In it, she describes her return to South Africa after three years in England, and here, and in, in, the, in the piece, she expresses the joy of seeing her family again, but also the shock of losing, losing some fluency in Isitlosa. Um, she also shares some feelings of, of possibly of some foreignness in her own land um, and an increased consciousness of the rising color bar in South Africa with uh, more se segregationist policies coming in. And it really, and it ends here um, as, as demonstrated in this excerpt with this moving reflection on being back home and the sense of, of connection. For me, the return intriguingly anticipates the opening of her first memoir, Drawn in Color, uh, where she narrates her journey back to South Africa, as, as Corsi has, has said, in 1955, when she had to return, um, well, she returned later, unfortunately, in quite difficult circumstances when she had to return for a funeral, but at this earlier point she was returning after, after three years away at school. So the Mount School Archives has many gaps, but it offers up some valuable, some valuable glimpses into Nonnie's uh, time as a schoolgirl in York, 
and it provides also some textured context, uh, which I think give us some some grasp of, um, of of influences on in her formative years, and also points to some of the York connections that would play out in different ways throughout her life. And um, I'm going to hand over now to Charles just to talk about her later period as, a, as an adult and how that intersects with the archives. Thank you, Janet. In the Mount School records at York, Non is not just the subject of the archive. As an author in the school magazine, she's also one of its co-creators. The same is true of um, many of her other appearances in the UK archives that uh, Cossie mentioned, such as her journalistic output or the letters to Beryl Graves, um, the widow of novelist and poet Robert Graves, um, who has mentioned letters incidentally in which she memorably describes E.M. Forster as a boring old man. Forty years on from her time at the Mount School, though, Nonnie reappears in our archival holdings, this time as a donor of a small collection of images and papers. Why York? Well, as well as the sort of long-standing connection from her earlier education, in 1974, the university had established a new centre for Southern African studies, and it had launched um, a project to preserve publications and archives relating to Southern Africa. Over the next decade, it built up a collection of largely personal um, and research papers from individuals and small organisations, alongside materials that derived from its own research and activities. The archive initiative had been the idea of another transnational creative, the exiled South African poet and anti-apartheid activist, Dennis Brutus. He suggested the centre try and provide a home for papers that might otherwise be lost or disposed of. Brutus started York's collections by depositing some of his own literary and political papers, including drafts of his poetic letters to Martha and other writings, and allowing still more to be microfilmed. The donors to the centre's project were mainly UK-based organisations and individuals. It was typically not the centre's intention to remove original manuscripts from Southern Africa. Instead, its preference was to secure and share copies in these cases. While the collections are mainly post-colonial, relating to politics and the church, the Scottish novelist and poet Naomi Mitchison gave some of her diaries, writings and papers on Botswana, and the anti-apartheid activist and playwright Peter Rodder also deposited the manuscript of his 1975 play, The Time of Breaking, based on his experience as a prisoner in South Africa. It was in 1975, following a visit from the centre's director to Nairobi, where he'd met Nonnie, that she offered copies of some of her family's early photographs and a copy of her 1953 testimony to the United Nations Commission on the Racial Situation in South Africa. And it was most likely Nonny that selected the material to be shared with the documentation project. One of the family's photographs she donated is this one of her parents' wedding in 1916, and it speaks to her illustrious forebears on both sides of the family. Her father, DDT Jabavu, was the first black professor at Fort Hare University College, and his bride, Florence Tandizwa Makawain, had taught at Lovedale, the South African missionary school where Nonny had started her primary education. Her paternal grandfather, seen at the back, was the editor of South Africa's first newspaper to be written in Isikosa, and her maternal grandfather was also a journalist as well as a minister. In this photograph, taken while Nonny was away at school in England, we see her younger, younger brother, Tengo Max, pictured standing with his sister, his parents and a cousin, at their house on the Fort Hare campus where DDT taught. In her second book, The Ochre People, published by John Murray in 1963, Nonny says of her father, throughout he had made it almost a mission to urge others to write down what they know. She describes the men of her uncle's lineage as walking archives and recounts that her grandfathers had encouraged their peers to write and recalled that a body of Isikosa literature had grown out of people um, recording their memories. So it's perhaps not surprising then that Nonnie accompanied her gift of the photographic surrogates with notes that included associated recollections. Although only brief and committed to scraps of paper, the notes like her cherished, um, sorry, her published works made um, further contribution to the social memory that she and her family had cherished and developed through their own sort of uh, literary output and publications. 
Here, Nonnie records memories of her family and the jacaranda trees and imported grass by their house. And in doing so, she enshrines certain events and experiences to embody aspects and values that, through the act of creating the small archive, also become part of the wide, wider shared cultural history that we see evidenced in her written works. She constructs archival memory while continuing this process of revisiting her own recollections. She also included this wonderful image of the McAwain family in her photographic selection. Seated in the center are her great grandparents, Mr. and Mrs. Lajabi McAwain. Behind them on the back row, third in from the left, we again see her maternal grandfather, the Reverend Elijah McAwain with his clerical collar. She recounts the story behind the image in the Oka people. Her great grandfather, quote, when he'd sensed that death was not far off, had sent for his children to come and make this record, this picture, end quote. Her uncle held the only copy, a lot of the family's mementos and manuscripts having been lost to time and accidents, including a, a fire. Nonny had arranged for new copies of the photograph to be made, quote, so that my uncle's surviving contemporaries each received one to hand down to the offspring who should know these things about their forebears. The quote ends there. The annotation that accompanies the image intertwines the provenance of the photograph and details of family lineage and sort of genealogy with her published recollections, and it adds further details. She thus provides and proliferates in these sort of notes and copies touchstones that help her connect different spaces, the familial and the academic, oral testimony with the documented record, a personal and private archive with her published works, and of course, the researcher with her readers. The South African archivist, Bern Harris, reflecting on the nature of archives, eloquently contends that, quote, far from being a simple reflection of reality, archives are constructed windows into personal and collective processes they at once express and are instruments of prevailing relations of power. And the quote ends there. Archives are not neutral, nor are they immutable, and they're obviously political, especially when it comes to the entitlement and prestige that can be associated with collection building and the politics of location. And they're also involved in processes over time. They, and not least their creators, custodians and interlocutors, can reinforce inequalities and elisions and can create narratives that silence voices. But by the same token, archives can also be liberatory, participatory and reactionary. The processes they're involved in can be personal as well as collective or administrative. Archives are multifaceted. Creators and donors such as Nonny can help project, protect and project the voices and cultures of those who are silenced or marginalized by prevailing structures of power and privilege. Archival discourses on fragmented and displaced archives um, look at the structural challenges of ownership and access, um, the legalities of copyright and uh, data protection and the need for better description of archives, as well as, of course, greater diversity in the voices that occupy our digital archival spaces and the mechanisms to identify and locate archival material more systematically and equitably. The work to challenge ourselves by critically interrogating the provenance, nature and the full cultural importance of the records that we as archivists and researchers and others hold and use, and, and certainly in archives, our own curatorial practices, provides new opportunities to understand and address the diasporic nature of so many literary papers and their transmission through transnational networking. As with Nonny and Dennis Brutus, this transition might, transmission might reflect the movement and networks of the original creators, with papers following their careers, um, resulting from their correspondence with people around the world or their own transnational status. There are also the deeper structural forces um, of colonialism and acquisition and the impacts of things like the apartheid regime that can affect the literary diaspora. Transmission also re results from different manifestations as material is reproduced or records are split between author and archive, public and private hands, or one repository and another. 
And so we see in the small collection of copied photographs and accompanying notes and papers from Noni Jabavu at York, that the creation, gift or acquisition of copies and transmission of archives may be more indicative of a more dynamic and pluralistic model than the, perhaps the traditional concept of an archive as a traditionally sort of singular fixed entity might at first imply. The creation of copies is not just a preservative act here, it allowed the donor to retain the originals. The copies speak to different contexts and relationships, on his role as the selector of images and the creator of this small collection. And in the context as well of her reflection in her first book, that she felt she belonged to two worlds, South Africa where she was born and Britain where she was educated. Finally, manifested as an archive, the copies provide for the co-creation of new stories, insights and research. And I hope in this session and through the work by, in particular by Kossi, Janet and Atembile Musola, that we've been able to provide you with a flavour of this. Thank you very much. And just a few references there. Thanks so much. I think this panel was just the perfect one to start with. It's so exactly engages with the conference themes of marginalization and recreating histories from the narratives that we can find. I, uh, in my preparation for chairing the session, I actually also came across information that uh, this incredible woman who I knew very little about before was not only a broadcaster journalist and award-winning author, but also took up welding during the Second World War, which I think is quite fantastic. I'm now going to be opening for questions from our audience. If there are any questions, please raise your hand. Uh, Louise, do you want to start? Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Lakisha, and thank you to all the speakers. Um, so my question has to be with primary resources and actually looking forward instead of back. Uh, regarding them. Um, my uncle is currently busy with our family history and as you said in all your uh, talks that letters form a very important part of how we understand um, people and their biographies and all of that. So my question is looking forward do you think we're going to be losing a lot of those primary sources since most of us are now living in a digital world very few of us are in the habit of printing our letters and our correspondence and even uh, when we speak to friends who are far away, we tend to do it on platforms such as WhatsApp. So would you suggest that if you were to plan on forming an archive later on in your life, that you should print all those, screenshot all your WhatsApps? And so I'd just like to find out um, what you think should we uh, uh, create almost our own forms of archive like that, or would we just accept the fact that we might lose things if we don't back up that information? Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a real a real threat. We are working with um, some writers, UK sort of based writers and that, and trying to set up sort of a digital archiving capacity and to work with them early because obviously the tolerances are, are much are much shorter um, before you know people would fill their shelves or move house and things fall out in a natural process and the and the material survives but now we have to be much more interventionist and that in itself can bring issues because you're not just sort of leaving it to chance you've got to be much more of an active active agent and that can skew the record but as you say I mean it's yet to be yet to be seen there is there's some hope that there are things that emails and others that can things that can be captured but as you say it very much depends on the on the platforms and the things that move and the you know from between sort of yeah whether you're working in in word or google or uh, whatsapp and where those conversations are now happening so um yes the pessimist in me suspects that it will be a bleaker and, and harder picture but there is there is some hope and we've certainly rescued stuff from the 1980s in old in old formats and and on discs so um so hopefully as as writers and publishers move um that and a greater awareness of those uh you know those issues that yeah thoughts of a new digital dark ages um you know uh, are sort of less less likely but but it, it it is it is concerning at the moment at the rate of at the rate of change and the ability to capture that and who occupies those spaces and makes those decisions 
Um, yeah, it's a very it's a very good question, and it's I've been thinking a lot about this, and you know, even in a in a form like email, which one can store and find different ways to to archive. Um, but I, I think it, yeah, um, I think it really sort of came to a head for me when I realized that I'd lost all the correspondence I'd had with Pazwani and Pe, whom I got to know uh, in the late 90s. We, we started off quite an extensive correspondence. He had, um, I was introduced to him uh, when he went to, um, went over to Oxford Brooks to do a publishing uh, postgraduate degree. And I went the year after and uh, we started up this, this correspondence by email, but using institutional email addresses. I was in Cape Town, he was in, uh, in Oxford. And then thereafter, we, we both moved around. And he was such an interesting correspondent. And we went into all sorts of topics, a lot of the, a lot of literary matters. And then, of course, he tragically, you know, passed away. Uh, and yeah, uh, I just had this deep sense of personal loss, but also of of loss in 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 terms of the record. And so, you know, even just with a, you know, with a with the methodology like. Uh, like email, there are all these kinds of questions that come into play. So I would love to know what the answers are and how we need to, I suppose there's just that greater conscious, I've certainly got developed a much greater consciousness of, of trying to think about issues of, of, of preservation. Thanks so much. Uh, are there any other questions for this panel? Um, Kosi, I have asked our Lizzie, our JCP team to share the two articles of yours that I found that I will be downloading and reading now that I know more about this amazing figure. And we will be hosting the Amazwi archives actually later on this afternoon at one, um, along with the institutional archives at WITS, UNISA, and the UP special collections uh, to discuss these kinds of issues of digitization, hopefully as well. Uh, Beth, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to comment a bit about this issue of some of the, the publishing records that we look for are business records, obviously, and some of them are still considered almost active records by some of the, the publishers, especially in the cases where they've been taken over by larger publishers, where there have been mergers and acquisitions. I found that to be the case. So for instance, a lot of my research has been on Raven Press and they were taken over by Hodder and then by Macmillan in the late 1990s. And it took me a long time to be able to access the Raven, they're not even archives, they're just records that are at Pan Macmillan in Johannesburg. Uh, I'm wondering if that's been the case for others who've been working with archives for John Murray or something like that. Although I know that their older records are more organized perhaps. Um, I also just wanted to ask if you have worked at all with the Raven archives, both at Amazwi and at Pan Macmillan, as I've been talking to Atambile quite a lot about the records that are there to look at the South African publications of Jababu's works. Uh, of course, I don't know if you if you have any comments about the um, John Murray archives and experiences of working there. Yeah, I I was very excited at the John Murray archives because it seemed to me that they had kept quite a lot. Now I don't know whether it was everything or noni, but they had kept quite a lot. The press that I was talking about, whose name I had forgotten, it's Saint, Ma Saint Martin's Press the ones who took over the, both of Noni's memoirs and published them in the US. Now, when I was trying to follow up on that archive, the contact I had at the time could only share with me what I would call their publishers in the room. They know the words for this, but the, the, 
they, they only shared with me the, the technical details of what they were planning around the books. Here's a measurement. This is how big the spine is going to be, this, that, and the other. I mean, I still have that, but I don't know what to do with it. There were no words. There was no communication. And I also heard that, uh, so the person that I was communicating with referred me to another university they met that they thought was keeping the records of the previous uh, St. Martin's Press, but no amount of following up resulted in anything on my part. So this, this thing that you're mentioning about how publishers get taken over by others it has been a, a big uh, challenge even for my research. Yeah, and the, the, the Raven Press archive, I started and I don't have a lot yet, let me put it that way. But what's interesting is that in those letters, the, the ones I mentioned earlier, the very first um, collection of letters I read, Noni talks a lot about her communication with the people who were running the Raven Press at that time. And it's the conversation she's sharing with a friend, but most of what she was sharing was the frustrations that she was uh, experiencing with the people who had published the Orca people. And so for me, what's, what I would like to be able to find from the Ravens press side is how they speak about what it meant for them to reissue Nuni's book in South Africa. Because in the letters, it's just complete ongoing frustration from Nuni's side. I would summarize it as the author who felt they were treated badly by the publisher. So I'm curious about what comes from Raven Press, whether it's, it's, it's even preserved because that's the other issue with the archives. It depends on who is putting together what and what they choose to put together and preserve. Sometimes they will get rid of, the, of stuff, so. Mm. Well, I can tell you that there's a lot of material. There's a, there's a solid file. Um, and I'm, I've shared most of the material with Atambile and I'd be happy to share it with you as well. It's a, a very complicated and interesting story of an author publisher relationship. <laughs> Absolutely. I think, you know, the, the question of publishers archives is a, uh, is such a, a big one and complex one um, and yes I think publishers you know they're very they, you know have a focus on curating others work but generally not their own their own um, makeup and and records and uh, yeah either tend to tend to just want to throw a lot of material out and keep as streamlined as possible or uh, you know, you know, or, or there, there are various sensitivities that, that may, uh, or, you know, various commercial interests that, that may mean that they don't want everything to become accessible. So yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a, an interesting space to work in and uh, I think a topic for, for further discussion. Uh, if there are any other questions for the panel while we have them here. Thank you so much to our JCB team for starting our conference then. Thank you, Janet, um, Kosi, and Charles for this incredible presentation. And yeah, I hope you can stick around for the rest of the presentations. And hopefully some of these questions will be answered in the archives panel as well. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. I have heard from our JCP team that we can now share the poll and we'll be coming back from our comfort break at 11.30 still for the next panel. And thank you, Hedza, for the general questions. We'll be sharing the poll now. There are tickets available for the underground book tour that will be happening. And I'll see you all at 11.30.